Now, the presidential candidate of African Action Alliance, Omoye Leshore, ran into troubled waters when in 2019 he was arrested by the Nigerian authorities in Abuja. After several dramatic court appearances, a human rights activist has at various points been re-arrested and detained and is at this very moment indefinitely restricted from travelling out of Abuja, Nigeria's political capital. In spite of all these, he won the nomination of his party to run for president in 2023. How does he intend to campaign? Well, the man himself has now joined us to, amongst, to talk about, uh, amongst other things, his preparedness for the forthcoming general elections, why he thinks the African Action Congress may have some ace up his sleeve as the underdog, and how he hopes to tap into young people's votes against the formidable machinery of the top three parties in the country. Good to have you here, Mr. Shawaray. Good morning. Thank you. Good morning for having me. Happy Sunday to We wish you the same. Good now morning. let's get uh, right into it. It is no news that you have been extremely critical of the current administration and the main opposition party for reasons that range from poor performance to a lack of know-how. Now in your bid and aspiration to the country's highest political office, how do you intend to change the status quo that you have criticized? What makes you think or believe that you're what Nigeria needs? Let's hear from you. Well, I ran first in uh, 2019 as a presidential candidate on the platform of uh, the African Action Congress, which was a political party that, created, that was uh, established about uh, six months before the elections in 2019. And ever since then, as uh, you introduced me earlier today, we have not stopped talking about the issues that brought people like me into the political arena and that led us to establish our own political party that is ideologically uh, designed to resolve numerous problems facing Nigeria and Nigerians. And uh, in 2019, I was uh, arrested because after we looked at the elections in 2019 and discovered that it was not going to solve Nigeria's social, political and economic problems, that we needed a revolution. And I came from the U.S. to champion that I was arrested shoved into several courtrooms, uh, accused of treason, restricted to Abuja. And uh, after several years in Abuja, I was uh, this year uh, given the license to travel around Nigeria. And shortly after that, our party that was hijacked in 2019 was restored to us by judgment of uh, the Court of Appeal here in Abuja. And we went into uh, serious work uh, had elections that has produced over 200 candidates across Nigeria. And I can tell you that uh, this shows that within a short period of time, and because we never stopped advocating and agitating for what matters to Nigerians, uh, this uh, led to massive show of support for the party in terms of the number of candidates we have. And we have been uh, working around the clock to ensure that in 2023, Nigerians are not presented with the same uh, despicable uh, opportunities that have led us to where we are now since the independence of Nigeria in 1960 and the advent of democracy in 1999. So we're ready and we will show to Nigerians that here is an option, another opportunity for you to finally change your narrative and not be deceived or brainwashed into supporting those who have made sure that you lost your dignity, your rights, uh, both political, social, and economic rights. And to, you know, here comes an opportunity for you to just completely change course, completely change course. That's why we're here. All right, Mr. Shawari, but um, could you state in specific terms how exactly you intend to change the status quo? I want to focus more on your critique of the, of the current administration and how you will pretty much become the opposite of that? Well, the administration came into existence in 2015 and, you know, found its way into power uh, crookedly in 2019. And each time they came, they told everyone that they're here to improve the economy, they're here to fight corruption, and they're here to ensure that Nigerians live a secured life. And they have failed in all those areas. Uh, this administration has now been known as one of the most corrupt uh, in the history of Nigeria. You know recently their accountant general, uh, now former, was found 
to have stolen over 150 billion naira at a time that universities are shut down some of this money were they not stolen could have solved the problem of uh, the ASU strike they said it will secure the country nobody and nowhere is secure in nigeria including the president of uh, the federal republic of nigeria you now see terrorists bandits and kidnappers threatening to kidnap the president of nigeria there was a time the president had to travel back to his home state and they have to bribe terrorists who were in possession of uh, stringer missiles stolen from the Nigerian uh, military so that they would not shoot down the airplane carrying the president to his home state, Kassina. They promise economic development for the country and all the indices economically are showing in the negative as we speak today. People are poorer than they, they used to be. This country, under this APC regime and under President uh, uh, Buhari's regime, came to become the poverty capital of the world. It became the place where more kids couldn't find their way to school. It became the place where schools, tertiary institutions that are necessary for both economic development, uh, innovation, for the future of this country, have been shut down for six months and going into seven months now. It became the place where the minimum wage became the miserable wage for workers. It became the place where nobody can guarantee reaching their destination if they are traveling by road or even now by air. So all those indices that should have made life you know, very great for Nigerians have been subjected to neg negative results. And it was as if, or it, it is clear now, that Nigerians were sabotaged in the last seven years by the regime. And that is what we are saying, that these things can change. But you cannot change the statistics uh, if you go for more of the same. What do I mean by more of the same? The same people who have been involved in putting Nigeria in the doldrums cannot be the ones who are, we're going to turn to to take us out of the doldrums, considering that all of them are complicit in the situation that we have found ourselves. All right, Mr. Shure, uh, thanks again for, for joining us. Um, the Nigerian Bar Association, MBA, had uh, its conference in Lagos uh, last week and it was big, it was loud. Uh, part of what they did was to invite uh, a number of presidential candidates, and they extended the invitation beyond uh, the big three, if you like. Uh, we had uh, Dumebi Kachiku, you know, being part of it. Uh, the SDP presidential candidate, you know, was also part of it. But you were conspicuously absent. Um, did you miss the opportunity, or did you reject if an invitation was sent to you at all? No, I was not invited, uh, but I'm not surprised. Uh, some of these organizations have made s such decisions in the past. Uh, you remember in 2019, the Nigerian election debate group decided, after carrying out scientific polls across the country, that I was the, most, I was the third most popular uh, candidate, that I should not be allowed to participate in the presidential debate. They went for candidates who did not make any showing uh, in that polling that they did. In some markets, I came second. In some markets, I came third. This was revealed to me after that. In fact, we took them to court. It also has happened in the media, where they decide, for reasons best known to them, that these are the candidates that Nigerian people should be listening to. And these are the candidates of more of the same. So I think it was a political decision uh, on behalf of the NBA leadership that some of us should not, you know, particularly myself, should not be featured in that lineup. And I think it's wrong on their part to have done that. This is how elections are rigged beforehand. They know, you know uh, that if I were to show up on that lineup, I would say things that might upset to some of uh, uh, the people that were invited. And maybe those people also in advance might have requested that they don't want their feathers ruffled, so please don't bring people like Shore here who will come and say things that may make us uncomfortable. Uh, so I think that is what happened. I actually did reach out through a telephone number that was passed on to me to the chairman of uh, the NBA, uh, Ulumide Akpata, after that. I sent him a text and I said to him, this is wrong and uh, this is unfair 
And I thought the legal profession uh, was here to uh, bring justice and balance to you know, the political process. Uh, he never responded to me. So I think it was a wrong decision on their part. And now that we've seen that, you know, we're seeing biases, political biases in all of these activities, we should keep an eye on them. I call them out when they do things that are, that are wrong like this. I don't see how they could have invited all those people and leave those of us who have originated even the ideas of public debates during elections out of it. I think more of this kind of debate should happen uh, in universities when they decide to reopen the universities. Everybody who is interested in the progress of Nigeria, politically speaking, into the future should not leave out the very critical voices who are not afraid, who are willing to speak truth to power. And some of the candidates who have been invited or who get invited, even when they are not willing or ready to participate in these events, they are begging them. But finally, what I saw that happened was that uh, there, were, there were revelations after the event that these events are funded by special interests. I think the Nigerian Bar Association should ensure that its uh, conventions are funded by its members so that this kind of political biases that affects the credibility of such an organization will be eliminated in the future. Uh, all right. If, if organizations and institutions uh, like the MBA, uh, like those you know behind uh, debates, etc. If they are afraid of your radical, you know, inclinations, if they think that you will unsettle the status quo, um, how do you think that you will gain traction uh, moving forward towards um, the campaigns, which will start towards the end of next month and the election itself in February? Do you think at this point that you might? require, you know, a different strategy so that you are not usually, you know, always left out of such gatherings? Well, the only strategy that is important is a strategy that takes the Nigerian people out of the misery that has been uh, imposed upon them. We have been using diplomacy. It hasn't worked. People have gathered in conferences across the country and the world. It hasn't worked. I cannot change a strategy that says to you that when you wake up in the morning, you deserve food, you deserve a job, you deserve hospitals, you deserve good roads, you deserve your education system to work, you deserve systems that works for your own existence and your dignity as a citizen. Changing those strategies means that I will have to go and be part and parcel of those people who meet in dark places or who meet in London and other parts of the world to determine the political future of Nigerians without Nigerians sitting down across the table to determine these things. What we need to do is to get across to the Nigerian people. And I will do everything I can. Some of the strategies that some of the candidates are employing now are strategies we employed in 2018 and 2019 to bypass some of these hiccups that I mentioned to you. The media won't talk to me with due respect that Rice TV did grant me a lot of opportunities to speak about my programs in 2018 and 2019. So I would recuse you, but I didn't even get enough. But I remember that across the country, I was granted an interview maybe only 10 times, 2018 and 2019 by TV stations. Some radio stations did very well. But every day, every hour, you are, they're always granting interviews to proxies of candidates who would never come on, 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 on TV. Some of the candidates, you go to their houses and beg them to speak with you. Those of us who want to talk about the most important social political issues affecting our people, you don't want to talk to us. You want to change strategy. Strategy change means that I have to be speaking you know, with my tongue in cheek about things that are very important for the Nigerian people. If the Nigerian people would figure out how to listen to us, uh, we would go and speak to them through those uh, outlets. And internet is there as well. And we have been using internet extensively. But I think there are also rules, regulations that says, you know, that broadcast media in the country have a duty to allow all the candidates who are running for election, especially presidential uh, candidates, to be covered equally. So you are also violating 
rules that you are freely subscribed to in the system. But where the broadcast media is not the issue, and it's these organizations, we have to call the organizations out. You don't have a right to leave out voices that you're uncomfortable with, that the leadership of your organizations are not comfortable with. There are lawyers, plenty of lawyers, who are our friends, who listen to us, who are supporters. They want to hear us too. I have been inside courtrooms more frequently than any Nigerian person that I know of, as, you know, uh, sometimes even more than well-known terrorists. And I see all these lawyers, and they kept asking, you know, what can we do for you? Some of them are part and parcel of our, you know, of our legal teams since 2019. We are in and out of court. So you deprive all these lawyers an opportunity to hear from one of their popular uh, clients, and you tell me that is fair. It is wrong, and we must call them out. And I'm glad I was still about five months into the election. If our organization's planning events that will bring presidential candidates together, you have a chance to make sure that everybody is represented, especially those who are willing to show up and not those and not, you know, lay red carpets for those who will refuse to show up or who send proxies or representatives. I think um, that's wrong. Understood. So you will be staying true to your strategy regardless of the situation. Now, let's move this conversation back to some of the issues on the front burner. Now, we all know that the discourse around the economy is quite uh, pertinent currently. Let's look at the macro and the country's economic and fiscal position. In light of being in a state of hyperinflation pretty much, how would you address the issue of Nigeria's mounting debt levels should you come into power? You see, what you need to look at when it comes to debt accumulation is first to look at your debt to GDP ratio. It's turning out that we, have, we are maxing out not on that level yet, uh, because I've looked at the numbers and discovered that it's still manageable. But the problem is that if you are not producing, if you are having security challenges, and you are accumulating debt for consumption instead of for production, you are going to be in trouble. Uh, you're going to have physical uh, problem uh, with your economic system. The, the other issue is how do you manage your resources? If your resources are frittered away and you are not building infrastructure for which you claim uh, to have taken these loans and debts, then you are going to have problems. And what I will do is to, first and foremost, ask for a moratorium when I become president of Nigeria on the debt issue. Because I think the credibility of who emerges would also bore international confidence in the economy of uh, Nigeria. And secondly, to look at the debts, which of them are genuine, because what you have seen, even till now, uh, is that some of the monies that were borrowed as far back as military era were stolen. Abacha is an example of this. He's still sending money to, from his ATM all over the world to Nigeria, which just got $23 million the other day from the US. And some of the monies that he stole, <coughs> so I'm sorry, which people said were up to $5 billion, were some of the monies that they borrowed during those periods that never made it to the shores of Nigeria. So you have to investigate some of these debts or some of these borrowings that we are engaging in to make sure that they are actually getting to the shores of Nigeria and they are not sent into private uh, bank accounts of some of these individuals in government. That thorough check and audit of our debt profile is very, very important before we go into the international community and ask for a moratorium where necessary. Uh, and when you have a clear idea of what these, these things are, then you can be talking about what's the exact ratio of your debt to your uh, GDP. And of course, we cannot escape from engaging in real industrialization, uh, production, and investment in our people. You know, and as long as this is not done, and a debt overhang will always be a problem. But it's investments that are going on, productive investments that will bring in yield income into the country. Uh, make sure that we don't rely completely on oil revenues and uh, incomes alone, that we have known oil exports and revenue, and that we feed our people, we pay them well and get people back to work. We invest in education so that one day, innovation, uh, we drive development 
you know, absolutely in this country, and then these debt issues would not be the biggest problem you have to face. I lived in the U.S. for 20 years. They had a debt counter uh, on 14th Street in New York uh, City, which is one of where it's located. And it tells you on an hourly basis how much the U.S. is owing. U.S. is probably the biggest debtor in the world. And they will tell you in that debt counter as well how much of that money you are owing as, as an individual. But nobody's worried about the debt counter, uh, which is sitting right there telling you, you know, that you, they borrowed you probably into Stone Age. Because the system supposedly is working in the U.S. It's the same U.S. where you have this huge debt overhand that the U.S. government is paying back $10,000 to students who have been owing loans for several years. During the period of COVID, they put money in people's pockets. They ensure that their country was moving along, even though there was a pandemic. But in Nigeria, our leaders were stealing uh, things that they bought, you know, to assuage the, 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 the pandemic at that time. So the difference here yeah. that I'm Mr. telling you Mr. Show, is right? the quality of leaders who are managing all these issues. That's very important. Now, that's yeah. why we keep telling people to stop voting for people who are their enemies. You can't get out of this uh, without changing the players. All right, Mr. Shore, let me quickly ask you this uh, before uh, we uh, allow you to leave. Uh, in 2019, uh, there was an attempt towards an alliance. Uh, two of those who were meant to be part of that alliance are no longer running, Kingsley Mogalu, uh, Fela Drotoe. Uh, but here you are, you are still standing. Is there any likelihood of you going into any alliance uh, with any other party or presidential candidate, given the fact that, like Labour Party, uh, your structure is not as uh, elaborate, not as strong as the other key parties? Any likelihood of an alliance towards 2023 for you? No, I, I want to correct the impression that our structures are not as strong as of any candidate. We, some of the things I was saying in 2019 have become the sing song of the new parties or new participants now. That the Nigerian political structure that is touted as big structures, they are all structures that were designed for transactions. And that there are no real transactional party, I mean transactional, I mean political structures that can advance the good of our Nigerian people. And now everybody's saying that because the structures I've been talking about since 2019 are now evolving on their own, prompted by the desire of the people. And so many of the structures you are now talking about on TV, by the way, were the structures that we had built since 2019. I was the only candidate in 2019 that said the only thing that can make me go into an alliance are if people subscribe to a revolutionary solution to Nigerian problems. I was mocked and I walked out of the alliance talks and went to work, traveled around this country, and after the elections ended, it was the same structures that they said we didn't have that propelled the first revolution now protests across the country that led to my arrest. These same structures stood around on the streets and everywhere to advocate against police brutality that led you know, to answers. I will tell you, we never stopped. And some, I'm not saying that we should take credit for what happened during all those upheavals, but our structures stayed on the street. And our structures had been campaigning and advocating. You know, the structures may not have the kind of big money and influence of people who are afraid that if our structures become the mainstream structures that will propel the political process, they will lose out. So that anger that we have built over the last four years is being directed somewhere else where they feel they have political control. But our structures have not been affected. They are intact. And our structures are going to bring about the change, the revolutionary change, because I hate to use the word change. It's been bastardized by the APC government. But the revolutionary process that we always ask of that will bring an end to the misery in this country that the people of Nigeria deserve better and nothing but these organic structures that have been on the ground who are opposed, they are magically opposed to the flip-flopping structures of the major political parties can solve the problem. So the structures are there, and they are, you are going to see them at work because they are not the kind of structures that can be compromised. 
They are organic and they are not structures for show. They are structures for substance. And that's what I've been saying. And you are going to see them be at work. I would say to you that we may not have the big money uh, that is thrown into the political process at this time. But the little we have, and we keep calling for the support of the Nigerian people and masses like we did in 2019, when we went all out there to ask for support and people donated to our campaign. We will still do the same, but it is more important for us to keep our structures clean, compact, and effective than to throw out structures that will deceive you into another cul-de-sac for the next four years. If they take another four years from us, you, don't, right. you can't even imagine where Nigeria will be. All right. So that's, that's, that's very important. Okay, that's noted, Mr. Omoyele Shore, uh, presidential candidate of the African Congress Alliance. We want to thank you so much for joining us on the morning show today. Uh, it's thank African you. Action Congress. Sorry, yes. African Action Congress. Thanks for the correction. Action thank you. Congress. Absolutely, AAC. AAC. Right. And we wish you the very best uh, towards 2023. Thank you so thank much. You so much for